And joining us now on the line from Montreal, Sarah Chase, author of The Punishment of Virtue Inside Afghanistan After the Taliban. Good to meet you, Sarah. How are you tonight? I'm great. How are you? Just fine, thank you. I, we should tell our viewers that you went to Afghanistan as a national public radio reporter in the fall of 2001 to cover the war against the Taliban. You were stationed in Kandahar. What were things like five years ago when you got there? When I first got there, it was like if you can imagine a town pretending to be a turtle, pulling its head and its feet and its little hands inside its shell, that was what Kandahar was like. Every shop was battened down. There was no one on the streets. Um, there was quite a bit of old bomb damage in the town, not from the recent just-ended uh, conflict against the Taliban, but from the Soviet uh, occupation of Afghanistan almost a decade earlier. And so it almost looked like a kind of sandcastle that it's been a little bit washed away by the sea with their edges rounded, but no one on the streets. You had this sense of um, anticipation and kind of watching and waiting. Which way was the wind going to blow? What was going to happen next? Well, what happened next was you quit journalism and you decided to stay. How come? Um, Partly because somebody asked me to. It was President Karzai's uncle, who uh, I had finished my uh, rotation for NPR and was headed out of the region, and I had dinner with him. He had been a fabulous behind-the-scenes kind of cultural source for me, and he just popped the question, wouldn't you come back and help us? And I said yes before I even really <laughs> heard, uh, processed the question itself. But I think there were a couple of other reasons, the most important one being that um, you know, I, f I really did feel like the 21st century was opening, uh, not on January 1st, 2000 or 2001, but rather in that late 2001 after the 9-11 uh, attacks on the United States, which seemed to me to really be opening um, an era. And it, it wasn't clear, and it still isn't clear, I think, the direction that, that uh, we in North America and the rest of the world are going to go. And it seemed to me just tremendously important that Afghanistan come out right in terms of how that would have an impact on the way the world was going to go. I know this sounds a little bit grandiose, but, but it seemed like there was an effort to divide the world up into irrevocably hostile blocks, you know, like mm -hmm. instead of the, the communists and the capitalists suddenly were Islam against the West. And I don't believe in that kind of thinking. Well, I think before, before I pursue that a little more, I, I, okay. I guess I should ask, you're from, you're from Boston, right? You That's grew, correct. Grew up in America. That's right. I don't know how much, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know if you're married or you got kids or you got family, but I would imagine that whatever extended family you did have uh, would, be, would be completely appalled at the notion of you suddenly moving into the middle of a war zone. What was the family reaction like? Um, well, the, the most vociferous person is my mother, and you can imagine what her reaction is. But I think that she has gotten used to the idea that it's likely to be counterproductive <laughs> to try to interfere with the wacky schemes that, that, um, that I get myself involved in. And having been the mother of not really a war correspondent, but at least a conflict and post-conflict correspondent, I think she had gotten a little bit more used to um, these forays of mine into difficult places. She certainly would be happier, I think, particularly now as the situation has deteriorated, if I were not in Kandahar. And yet you're going to go back. Let's talk about that in a little while as well. Um, here's Jeffrey Simpson, who's um, a very fine columnist with the Globe and Mail, uh, who wrote this about, about you. Ms. Shays tells a gripping story about individuals and senior officials caught up in post-Taliban Afghanistan. Her portrayal of U.S. policy is devastating. Washington blasted Afghans' hopes for a better future by making alliances with warlords. U.S. officials and soldiers constantly misunderstood who was doing what in a country they barely knew. Mm. Could you help fill in some blanks for us then? What's the story we're missing? Well, I think that, um, as has now almost become a cliché, at least in the United States in recent months, this notion of not having a plan, there was no plan for what was going to happen in Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban. And I myself was quite um, astounded to discover that at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, for example, for the first six months, there was a kind of revolving door, and you would have officials who were in the embassy for, on two-week rotations. The longest rotation I saw in the first six months was six weeks. 
There was one embassy official who spoke a local language. There was no ambassador. I mean, it, it, it's really puzzling to me. How could the U.S. government plan to topple a regime and not even have an ambassador on tap to, you know, to, to um, move into the embassy once the regime was toppled? And so the result of that was that it was army officials on the ground in Afghanistan who, by default, ended up um, making the decisions that would have a tremendous political impact on the, the new Afghanistan. And, and what happened was they kind of, for tactical military reasons, hired these, um, these proxies. And they, um, uh, they the were... the warlords, I guess. Yeah. Eh? I mean, they were commanders who were totally discredited by, um, uh, uh, among the Afghan population. The one thing that Southern Afghans unanimously told me they were happy with the Taliban about was the fact that the Taliban had kicked these guys out of the country back in 1994. And so um, while it may have made some short-term military sense to hire these people and their gun-toting acolytes, you know, to be our proxies on the ground in October and November of 2001, it really didn't make a lot of sense to then usher them into positions of political power. Nobody in Afghanistan and wanted to see these people back in political power. And so, um, unfortunately, there was a kind of um, a, a shortcut thinking. Also, I would argue with U.S. officials about, um, you know, the wisdom of this policy. And I would say, you know, governance is what's really important here. We, we have to focus on good governance. That's what the Afghans are looking to us for. Well, was President and Karzai would, the guy for good governance? Well, I think President Karzai was. But, but what we then did was um, impose upon him these uh, provincial governors, these warlords in, in positions of power in the provinces. And every time he tried to either limit their power or remove them, U.S. officials got in his way or prevented him from doing that. And so what I would hear is something that I think um, even the Canadian defense minister has said recently, which is, well, well, we'll worry about governance later. If we can establish security first, then good governance will come. Well, it turns out that um, it was these warlords who were creating the insecurity for the first two or three years. And then the Afghan population has gotten so disgusted with them that when Taliban come knocking on their door at night, as uh, has been happening in the last year or so, and ask for food or ask for a place to stay, people shrug their shoulders and say, you know what, as between the government and the Taliban, both of them are hostile to us, so we don't really care. Hmm. Here, let, let me read an excerpt from a piece you wrote in the Globe and Mail uh, in October. What's being called a Taliban insurgency is not, in my view, a true insurgency. It's not an ideological grassroots uprising against the Western presence in Afghanistan. Rather, it is a low-grade invasion mm. primarily orchestrated across the border in Pakistan. The evidence for this conclusion is abundant. Now, uh, we certainly used to hear many years ago the notion that the Taliban were the creation of Pakistan's ISI, their secret service, do you believe that Pakistan is still fomenting absolutely. dissent in Afghanistan for absolutely. its own ends? Absolutely. I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever. And as I said, the, the, the evidence is abundant. Why are they doing it? I think they're doing it because they, um, in a very short-sighted um, uh, idea about regional power politics, I think that uh, Pakistan remains obsessed with its relationship with India, and it feels that India is bigger and stronger and tougher and stuff like that. And there's this notion of strategic depth and this idea that, well, if Pakistan just had like a backyard that it could fade back to, um, that would make it more powerful or way more heavily in the regional balance of power. So you see things like um, Pakistan's nuclear program all has Afghan names. The, its major nuclear, I think the delivery system, is called the Ghurid missile. Now, the Ghurids were a uh, 13th century dynasty based in, in central Afghanistan. The um, telephone exchange of Kandahar under the Taliban regime was a Pakistani country code and a Balochistan area code telephone hmm. exchange. In other words, there's this sense in which Pakistan regards Afghanistan as, in a way, its own territory. And short of actually controlling it through a proxy, like the Taliban, it doesn't want anybody else to control it, and it certainly doesn't want it to be a healthy, strong, vibrant, democratic, independent country. Let's talk more about connecting with the people of Afghanistan. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard this question a thousand times, but I want to hear your answer. Are the people there ready for democracy? 
You know, I do hear it a thousand times. And um, I hear, are they ready to, for democracy or are we just imposing it? And so first of all, I say that, I, you know, I don't want to sound totally cynical. But what I've observed um, as a result of Western and in particular American uh, policies in Afghanistan is the imposition of warlordism, corruption, stolen elections, and torture. And, and as I often ask um, American audiences, is this really what we think of when we think of American democracy? And by contrast, um, I had a women's discussion group uh, working on constitutional issues. There were illiterate women as well as high school uh, principals in this group. They were talking about a bicameral legislature. This was before the Constitution was actually um, drafted. They wanted a bicameral legislature. They wanted an upper house like a Senate, which would have four uh, delegates from each province, two men and two women. They wanted. Um, uh, parity in politics for men and women. They wanted um, mandatory national service as a way of breaking down the ethnic divides within Afghanistan. How are they doing on that checklist? Um, well, the Constitution, as it worked out, wasn't as good as the one that, that my women drafted. But mm -hmm. believe me, I would have been perfectly proud to live as a citizen under the Constitution they drafted. When I asked people in my cooperative what jobs they would want if, if we collectively were mayor of Kandahar, it's a joke um, that we have sometimes in the morning over breakfast. One wanted to be the garbage man to clean up the streets. One wanted to be the guy who goes around in the bazaar and checks the weights and measures, makes sure that a pound of bread actually weighs a pound. These people know what they want. They, they're, they're very sophisticated, and what they want from their government is really quite similar to what I think most of us want from our government. Hmm. Well, ca Canadians, of course, care a great deal about this place because uh, Afghanistan is, the, I think, the single largest recipient now of Canadian aid. And, of course, our soldiers are on the ground there and are supposed to be there until the year 2009. Mm. What I want to know from you is how are Canadian soldiers perceived by the local population that they're trying to help? Um, they are well perceived. Uh, it is definitely everyone agrees that absent uh, Canadians, we would not be able to function as a city and as a province. The, the province would really, under the hammer blows of uh, what you just quoted me describing as a low-grade invasion from Pakistan, um, the place would really fall apart. I think that um, there is some concern about wanting um, to see more involvement by Canadians Canadians in the reconstruction of the province and in particular in um, economic development. And that's a, it's a lot harder to help people on the road to economic development, to setting up functioning businesses, productive economy, than it is to, let's say, build a, build a clinic. You know, you build a mm -hmm. building, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And so what I do see is some desire on the part of Afghan people that, that um, the Canadian presence get more involved in some of the subtler issues and become more involved in um, the demand for accountability from these provincial uh, provincial officials because very often um, the ordinary people or let's say entrepreneurs or people who are trying to make a constructive um, contribution to their country they 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 run into this warlordism and they've got no recourse and they would love to see the Canadians running a little bit of interference for them uh, in their name with um, sometimes their predatory or, or um, at best, um, negligent hmm. public officials. I want to share with you the results of a poll done by Enveronics, which is one of the larger polling companies here in Canada. They were in the field from the 2nd to the 6th of November. And the question that they asked people was, uh, do you think Canadian troops should get out of Afghanistan before hmm. 2009? And 59% of the Canadian public surveyed said yes. What would you say to that 59%? I would say two things. One is, I could not stay in Kandahar if your troops were not present. And I have to just express to you my personal gratitude and the gratitude of the Afghans with whom I work for your presence and your sacrifice and your um, you know, psychological stress. And I know it's hard on families and things like that. But believe me, you are not doing an offensive mission against the Afghan public there. You are protecting the Afghan people against um, a really nefarious uh, 
uh, policy on the part of, um, of neighboring countries. And so it's two things. It's number one, the rest of us who are trying to rebuild the country wouldn't be able to stay there and do that work if you weren't there. And secondly, it's a, it's a, um, it's a work of protection of the civilian population that your troops are, are uh, undertaking there, and it's terribly important. It's not sufficient. It's necessary for Afghanistan to, um, to kind of pull itself up out of the rut that it's been in for almost 30 years now. The Canadian to troops' pl presence is necessary to that. What's also necessary is a real reform on the part of mm -hmm. Afghan political officials. But without your presence, that reform is impossible. What I would also urge is that you not, um, I, I actually strongly disagree with the notion that, well, if we just think about security, warlordism will fall away. No, I think that you do need to turn some of your attention to the misbehavior of Afghan public officials and be the advocates of the Afghan civilian population against those public officials rather than empowering warlords. But please stay. Well, having said all that, sir, let me ask you one last thing, which is the British left this country with their tails between their legs. The Soviets left this country with their tails between their legs. How well do you think this latest foreign intervention is going to work out? I think those two examples really aren't comparable because those were two empires that were really seeking to take over Afghanistan. And Afghans are very clear when somebody wants to take over their country, they are against it. But I think they understand everyone. And I'm, I'm living in the Taliban stronghold. I'm living in the part of the country that by rights ought to be the most anti-Western. And believe me, people understand the distinction between what the international community is trying to do on behalf of Afghanistan now and uh, the efforts at um, expanding empire, uh, which you just described, the Soviet empire and before that the British empire from India. Sarah Chase, it's great to talk to you. Please be safe on your return visit to Afghanistan and we certainly uh, recommend for people The Punishment of Virtue, your latest book. Take care. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure.